In the years leading up to the call to crusade, Alexios I Comnenus, emperor of Constantinople, reached out to Pope Urban II in the West for military aid. This was quite a bold move considering that the East-West divide had devolved into outright war against the Latins by the Greeks under Chemnenus. In the year 1095 AD, Alexios sent two representatives to Pope Urban's council at Piacenza. The Seljuk Turks had seized control of Anatolia, the vast land directly across from Constantinople. Alexios was worried, very worried. Because Alexios's daughter, Anna Comnena, whose writings give us a window to the time, never mentioned her father reaching out for help from the West in her writings, some historians presume that Alexios hoped they could get the Latins involved without submitting to any Western authority or making themselves appear desperate. The tensions of the centuries may not have allowed such a warm alliance either. Even at that moment, the Eastern and Western Christian countries fought over lands and boundaries. Some think Pope Urban was already considering military action even as Alexios's diplomats were en route to Piacenza. How could he not be at this point? Further, invasion by Islam in the West was inevitable particularly after the successful Iberian invasions. Moreover, Seljuk Turks in control of Anatolia put them closer to Rome, too, not just Constantinople. Pope Urban's approach was very different than perhaps any pope had been before him. He had been a contemplative. As a result, he was a strong spiritual leader, virtuous and wise, he undoubtedly saw the potential to reunite the East and West, which appeared more and more wise as time went on and as the Muslims grew in power. In 1089 AD, Urban had lifted the excommunication the Latin Church had placed on Alexios I. Some have wondered if that was not a step toward a grander vision for unity in the Church. Since there was some positive exchange in the recent past, it may have made Comnenus comfortable enough to bring the issue of military aid before Pope Urban. For his part, Alexios had also been making strides to get along. While on pilgrimage to Jerusalem in 1086 AD, Robert the Count of Flanders had taken to the field with Alexios and made a campaign against the Seljuk Turks. Still, critics might insist the Pope was after a thousand years still trying to assert Rome's authority by any plan to assist Alexios. If there were a way Urban could have accomplished that through supporting the Greeks, there is no doubt he would have done it. Yet, as mentioned before, it is certainly not accurate to suggest this was his sole motivation. If anything, when taken on the whole, it is hard not to gain a great deal of respect for Pope Urban II and the decisions he made in the waning years of the 11th century. More than rites and rituals, he was about to again raise the lowest moral common denominator in the way Europeans thought and lived their Christian lives. In preparation for what would be the largest spiritual, military, and political movement in the Middle Ages, Pope Urban began making his way around France. At the same time, issues over the papal legitimacy of competing interests stood to derail Pope Urban just as he was getting started. What was called the Investiture Controversy had begun when Pope Gregory VII had presided over the first serious attempt to remove the Church from temporal affairs by revoking the right of the monarchs particularly the Holy Roman Emperor, any role in selecting the Pope. From then on, the College of Cardinals would elect the Pontiff. Gregory's successors, Victor III and Pope Urban II, struggled to maintain the mechanisms of authority when, in response to the new canon law, the Holy Roman Emperors 
continued to select their own choice as pope. Most of the time, Urban could not even get into Rome for the siege weapons aimed day and night at the papal residence there. As he began touring France, he mulled over the words of what would be his most impassioned and popular speech. Was France the right place to start? How would the French nobleman respond to what he had in mind? He focused his attention there because he felt the Franks were the ones powerful enough to build up a good crusader military force for what he would propose. But how could he motivate these men to go so far from home and under such peril? He was considering instituting new spiritual benefits for those willing to rise up to the aid of Eastern Christians in pushing back the Turks and other Muslims, whether back to Arabia or back east. That's not all that was on the Pope's mind. Even while asking the Franks for support for what would become a crusade into the Holy Land, years away from home, risk to life and limb, he was also about to excommunicate the French king for adultery. At the same time, asking him to invest his wealth in the lives of his people. Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, a wealthy lord who had campaigned on the Iberian Peninsula, a powerful Frenchman aware of the Muslim threat against Christendom, prepared for the Pope's big announcement, which he would make at the upcoming Council of Clermont. It is possible that Raymond was one of the men the Pope had confided in ahead of time to help mold his vision. This is admittedly speculation, but perhaps well-founded when the sources are taken on the whole. Adamar of Le Puy was another, designated as the spiritual leader of the crusade, thankfully a voice of reason to balance the variety of strong personalities that such an endeavor would draw. Clergy from the region were asked to encourage knights all over France and even beyond to travel to Clermont for the council coming that November. Nineteen archbishops and eighty-two bishops, abbots, and clergy from all over Europe. Many came to the council at Clermont, the final stop for Urban, and a culmination of constant travel and many countless speeches and meetings, hours spent in prayer molding his ideas. In Clermont, on that cold November day in the French countryside, his case for the crusade would stand or fall. As if that in itself was not a big enough issue, essentially asking for thousands across Europe to uproot themselves and completely alter the direction of their lives, the council first took up several other issues when it convened. Simony and the lay investiture controversy, the curbing of corrupt activities among the clergy, and as mentioned, there was the sticky issue of the King of France's infidelity. As Pope Urban made his way to Clermont, he finished preparing his remarks. As he closed in on the village, they were making last-minute preparations, too. A stage had been erected, especially for the event, and a dais placed in just the right spot so that everyone could hear, as they expected a large crowd. When the day arrived, both church and lay leaders from all over France packed into the small village, when the time came for Urban to speak, he rose and took the dais. The crowd slowly fell silent, and Urban paused just briefly before beginning to speak. Your brethren who live in the East are in urgent need of your help, and you must hasten to give them aid which has often been promised to them. For as most of you have heard, the Turks and Arabs have attacked them and have conquered the territory of Romania, as far west as the shores of the Mediterranean and the Hellespont, which is called the Arm of St. George. They have occupied more and more of the land of those Christians and have overcome them in seven battles. They have killed and captured many 
and have destroyed the churches and devastated the empire. If you permit them to continue, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them. On this account, I, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ's heralds to publish this everywhere and to persuade all people of whatever rank, foot soldier and knights, poor and rich, to carry aid promptly to those Christians and to destroy that vile race from the lands of our friends. I say this to those that are present. It is meant also for those who are absent. Moreover, Christ commands it. Constantinople was to be the place of meeting, where they would join with the Eastern forces under Emperor Alexios Komnenos. Together, they would take back the territory now occupied by the Seljuk Turks. This was about more than just helping an ally. The Pope talked about how the battles were to be for Christ himself, a high-minded ideal. War had been for such greedy and self-serving reasons in Europe. The ravaging of the globe by Muslim hordes had reduced much of the civilized world to subjugation. Now one could take up the cross, as Urban called it, and fight for the Lord Jesus Christ. War would be of a higher mindset, a Christian one, where the virtue of knighthood and chivalry would dictate the actions of vanquisher, foe, and vanquished. This was to be the restoration of Christ to the role of supremacy, and the Latins of Western Europe would carry the banner.